Not too long ago, two friends of mine were talking to a Cuban refugee, a businessman who had escaped from Castro. And in the midst of his story, one of my friends turned to the other and said, we don't know how lucky we are. And the Cuban stopped and said, how lucky you are. I had some place to escape to. And in that sentence, he told us the entire story. If we lose freedom here, there's no place to escape to. This is the last stand on Earth. Guess I'll just close my eyes. I have spent most of my life as a Democrat. I recently have seen fit to follow another course. But unlike most television programs, the performer hasn't been provided with a script. As a matter of fact, I have been permitted to choose my own words and discuss my own ideas regarding the choice that we face in the next few weeks. I believe that the issues confronting us cross party lines. No nation in history has ever survived a tax burden that reached a third of its national income. And yet our government continues to spend more than the government takes in. We haven't balanced our budget, we've raised our debt limit, and now our national debt is bigger than all the combined debts of all the nations of the world. We have gold in our treasury, we don't own an ounce. As for the peace that we would preserve, I wonder who among us would like to approach the wife or mother whose husband or son has died in Manaskam if they think this is a peace that should be maintained indefinitely. Do they mean peace or do they mean we just want to be left in peace? There can be no real peace while one American is dying someplace in the world for the rest of us. We're at war with the most dangerous enemy that has ever faced mankind in his long climb from the swamp to the stars. And it's been said if we lose that war, and in so doing lose this way of freedom of ours, history will record with the greatest astonishment that those who had the most to lose did the least to prevent its happening. Well, I think it's time we ask ourselves if we still know the freedoms that were intended for us by the founding fathers. And this idea that government is beholden to the people, that it has no other source of power except the sovereign people, is still the newest and the most unique idea in all the long history of man's relation to man. This is the issue of this election. Whether we believe in our capacity for self-government or whether we abandon the American Revolution and confess that a little intellectual elite in a far distant capital can plan our lives for us better than we can plan them ourselves. You and I are told increasingly we have to choose between a left or right. Well, I'd like to suggest there is no such thing as a left or right. There's only an up or down, man's dream the ultimate in individual freedom consistent with law and order, or down to the ant-heap of totalitarianism. Those who would trade our freedom for security have embarked on this downward course. We were told we must accept a greater government activity in the affairs of the people. But they've been a little more explicit in the past. And among themselves, and all of the things I now will quote have appeared in print. For example, they have voices that say, the Cold War will end through our acceptance of a not undemocratic socialism. Another voice says the profit motive has become outmoded. It must be replaced by the incentives of the welfare state. Or our traditional system of individual freedom is incapable of solving the complex problems of the 20th century. That the Constitution is outmoded. And he says he is hobbled in his task by the restrictions of power imposed on him by this antiquated document. He must be free so that he can do for us what he knows is best. Liberalism meeting the material needs of the masses through the full power of centralized government. Well, I for one resent it when a representative of the people refers to you and me, the free men and women of this country, as the masses. The full power of centralized government. This was the very thing the founding fathers sought to minimize. They knew that governments don't control things. A government can't control the economy without controlling people. And they know when a government sets out to do that, it must use force and coercion to achieve its purpose. Now the price of bread goes up, the price of wheat to the farmer goes down. Meanwhile, back in the city, under urban renewal, the assault on freedom carries on. Private property rights so diluted that public interest is almost anything a few government planners decide it should be. In a program that takes from the needy and gives to the greedy. So they're going to solve all the problems of human misery through government and government planning. And the more the plans fail, the more the planners plan. Well now, if government planning and welfare had the answer, shouldn't we expect government to read the score to us once in a while? Shouldn't they be telling us about the decline each year in the number of people needing help, the reduction in the need for public housing? 
the reverse is true. Each year the need grows greater, the program grows greater. We have so many people who can't see a fat man standing beside a thin one without coming to the conclusion the fat man got that way by taking advantage of the thin one. The trouble with our liberal friends is not that they're ignorant, it's just that they know so much that isn't so. Because as long as they had the power to tax, they could always take away from the people whatever they needed to bail them out of trouble. I think we're for an international organization where the nations of the world can seek peace. But I think we're against subordinating American interests to an organization that has become so structurally unsound that today you can muster a two-thirds vote on the floor of the General Assembly among nations that represent less than 10% of the world's population. We're for aiding our allies by sharing of our material blessings with those nations which share in our fundamental beliefs. But we're against doling out money government to government, creating bureaucracy, if not socialism, all over the world. No government ever voluntarily reduces itself in size. So government programs, once launched, never disappear. The nation's workforce employed by government. These proliferating bureaus with their thousands of regulations have cost us many of our constitutional safeguards. How many of us realize that today federal agents can invade a man's property without a warrant? They can impose a fine without a formal hearing, let alone a trial by jury. And they can seize and sell his property at auction to enforce the payment of that fine. Stop the advance of socialism in the United States. Because back in 1936, Mr. Democrat himself, Al Smith, the great American, came before the American people and charged that the leadership of his party was taking the party of Jefferson, Jackson, and Cleveland down the road under the banners of Marx, Lenin, and Stalin. The leadership of that party has been taking that party down the road in the image of the Labour Socialist Party of England. Now, it doesn't require expropriation or confiscation of private property or business to impose socialism on a people. What does it mean whether you hold the deed to the, or the title to your business or property if the government holds the power of life and death over that business or property? And such machinery already exists. The government can find some charge to bring against any concern it chooses to prosecute. Every businessman has his own tale of harassment. Somewhere a perversion has taken place. Our natural unalienable rights are now considered to be a dispensation of government. And freedom has never been so fragile, so close to slipping from our grasp as it is at this moment. Our democratic opponents seem unwilling to debate these issues. There is no foundation like the rock of honesty and fairness. And when you begin to build your life on that rock, with the cement of the faith in God that you have, then you have a real start. And that is the issue of this campaign that makes all the other problems I've discussed academic, unless we realize we're in a war that must be won. Those who would trade our freedom for the soup kitchen of the welfare state have told us they have a utopian solution of peace without victory. They call their policy accommodation. And they say if we'll only avoid any direct confrontation with the enemy, he'll forget his evil ways and learn to love us. They say we offer simple answers to complex problems. But well, perhaps there is a simple answer, not an easy answer, but simple. If you and I have the courage to tell our elected officials that we want our national policy based on what we know in our hearts is morally right, we cannot buy our security, our freedom, by committing an immorality so great as saying, give up your dreams of freedom, because to save our own skins, we're willing to make a deal with your slave masters. Alexander Hamilton said a nation which can prefer disgrace to danger is prepared for a master and deserves one. Now let's set the record straight. There's no argument over the choice between peace and war, but there's only one guaranteed way you can have peace and you can have it in the next second. Surrender. Admittedly, there's a risk in any course we follow other than this, but every lesson of history tells us that the greater risk lies in appeasement. And this is the specter our well-meaning liberal friends refuse to face, that their policy of accommodation is appeasement. And it gives no choice between peace and war, only between fight or surrender. If we continue to accommodate, continue to back and retreat, eventually we have to face the final demand, the ultimatum. And what then? When the time comes to deliver the final ultimatum, our surrender will be voluntary because by that time, we will have been weakened from within spiritually, morally, and economically. He believes this because from our side he's heard voices pleading for peace at any price, or better read than dead, or as one commentator put it, he'd rather live on his knees than die on his feet. And therein lies the road to war, because those voices don't speak for the rest of us. 
you and I know and do not believe that life is so dear and peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery. If nothing in life is worth dying for, when did this begin? Just in the face of this enemy? Or should Moses have told the children of Israel to live in slavery under the pharaohs? Should Christ have refused the cross? Should the patriots at Concord Bridge have thrown down their guns and refused to fire the shot heard round the world? The martyrs of history were not fools. And our honored dead, who gave their lives to stop the advance of the Nazis, didn't die in vain. Where then is the road to peace? Well, it's a simple answer after all. You and I have the courage to say to our enemies, there is a price we will not pay. There is a point beyond which they must not advance. The destiny of man is not measured by material computations. When great forces are on the move in the world, we learn we're spirits, not animals. There's something going on in time and space and beyond time and space, which, whether we like it or not, spells duty. You and I have a rendezvous with destiny. We'll preserve for our children this, the last best hope of man on earth, or we'll sentence them to take the last step into a thousand years of darkness. You and I have the ability and the dignity and the right to make our own decisions and determine our own destiny. Guess I'll just close my eyes. Stop the advance of socialism in the United States. Because back in 1936, Mr. Democrat himself, Al Smith, the great American, came before the American people and charged that the leadership of his party was taking the party of Jefferson, Jackson, and Cleveland down the road under the banners of Marx, Lenin, and Stalin. And he walked away from his party and he never returned till the day he died. <laughs>